Hello, everybody. Welcome to class. Today's class is on the ratification debates. We are so happy to see you all in here. We are excited and we are here with one of our top scholars, Tom Donnelly. Tom Donnelly is really excited because we get to talk about ratification. And Tom, I'm going to let you know right now. I know our students have been sending me questions, but I also have a bazillion questions about ratification. And I think we can probably start off with the easiest one. What is the ratification process and when the heck did it happen? Like, give us like time and place. When are we, what were we doing in our country and kind of set the stage for us. Sure, that sounds great, Curry. And hi, I'm, I'm Tom Donnelly. I am one of the uh, senior fellows for constitutional studies at the National Constitution Center. And thanks so much for being with us uh, this week to talk about ratification. So Curry, I think I'll start, maybe I'll give just a very brief timeline and then try to tee up a couple of big ideas and then we can take it from there. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Lay it out for us and kind of help us build our understanding about this kind of a momentous moment in American history. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, let's start where we ended last week, which is, you know, it's, sep it's September 17th, 1787. Uh, the delegates to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, they've just finished uh, the Constitution. They've signed it. But as we're there in, in, in the, the, the Pennsylvania State House in Independence Hall, uh, there are three dissenters. So there are three people who were active participants throughout the convention who decide not to sign the Constitution. They are a useful um, way to frame the debates that go on um, from that point forward. So who are these three dissenters? Well, we have Edmund Randolph, George Mason, and Elbridge Gerry. And these are all really important figures. Elbridge Gerry, you know, a key figure in Massachusetts. Edmund Randolph, Edmund Randolph was an ally of Madison, presented the Virginia plan at the beginning of the Constitutional Convention, Virginia governor, eventually attorney general for George Washington. So really significant Virginian figure. And then George Mason, another elite Virginian, wrote the Virginia Declaration of Rights, one of the early, the, really the, 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 the fountainhead of the Bills of Rights throughout the United States, an inspiration for Thomas Jefferson when he drafted the Declaration of Independence, George Mason, this really huge Virginian figure. And so what are they objecting to? Why are they not signing the Constitution? Well, one thing, not surprisingly, given Mason is one of these figures, is they're concerned about the lack of a Bill of Rights in the Constitution as it's signed on sep September 17th. And so Mason, Elbridge Gerry, they're pushing a couple days before the end of the convention, let's just do a Bill of Rights. George Mason even says something along the lines of, just give me a few hours, give me like a day or so, I can put it together, we can just crank this out. And you can imagine from the perspective, just practically of the delegates, it's hot, it's sweaty, they've been debating for months, they finally have this document that nearly all of them are ready to sign and they say, no, 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 we'll, 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 we'll hold off on that. So, one, so one, one key thing here is no Bill of Rights in the original constitution. The other is that for multiple of these dissenters, a concern that the national government under the new constitution is gonna to be too strong. And so it's these two objections that they have in mind right there, so September 17, 1787. So what happens after that? Well, the constitution itself sets up a process for ratification, a process for how are we going to approve or reject a new constitution. It's in Article 7 of the original constitution. And what it says is that the constitution is ratified when nine of 13 states decide to ratify it through state ratifying conventions. And so over the course of the next roughly year, you have each state holding elections for delegates to state ratifying conventions, and they hold conventions. And so they, the task there at the state ratifying convention is Yay or nay? Do we want the new constitution or do we not want the new constitution? So we have this process put out there um, as to whether or not we're going to approve the constitution. We see Americans line up on two, both sides of this question. So as, as, we're just, as we're talking today, the supporters of the constitution, we call the federalists and the opponents of the constitution, we call the anti-federalists. And I mean, the one thing that's amazing to think here is you know, we think of the Constitution as inevitable because we live under it. We know how this story ends. But for the 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 the, the, the Americans after the after the Constitutional Convention that have to decide yay or nay, it's not a foregone conclusion. The votes are really close. There are prominent Federalists. There are prominent anti-Federalists. And so it's a really it ends up being a dynamic process. And and one final thing to frame this, Curry, is remember from the perspective of ordinary Americans what they may be thinking. So you had these delegates meet in the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia. George Washington's there, Benjamin Franklin's there, really big Americans, but no one really knows what to expect after the convention. What did the, con what did the convention actually uh, accomplish? And remember, their proceedings were in secret. No one knows what's really going on. When Congress gives the delegates their mandate, they say, 
consider changes to the Articles of Confederation. So the American people are sitting there, elites and ordinary Americans alike are thinking, oh, what do we think we're going to get? We're probably going to get amendments to the Articles of Confederation. You know, some big changes, some small changes, but that we will still live under the Articles. Instead, they get a proposal for a new constitution. So you could imagine putting yourself in the, in the shoes of people who are not at the convention. Um, uh, just their mind must have been blown. And so I'll sort of leave. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of frame it there, and we could, you know. Anyway, ha, 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 we could go in a lot of different directions from there. I know, and that's. I think that's the exciting part about it. So, like, you know, May twenty fifth. The convention starts, they're in secret all summer long and people hear a little bubbling, but they're in secret and discussing and debating it. Um, and then on September 17th, the new constitution is written. It takes two days to get out in a newspaper. And here's a copy of one of the newspapers that went out, but two days. And so the first way people see this is in the newspaper, right, Tom? And how quickly does word of this spread around the country because it's not like we have twitter it's not like we have like social media or you know you can't pick up the phone so how quickly does the hubbub kind of buzz through the states and how much are normal people talking about it not just you know the elites the people that are voting but everyday people that's a, that's a great question, Curry. And you know, from the standards of today, it takes a really long time. From the standards of the time, <laughs> it's it's fairly quick. And so, you know, let, 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 let's let's just think about it. So your question there, Curry, a great question is, you know, how democratic is this moment? Who's really debating the Constitution? What are they saying? We'll get into the specifics of the arguments, but sort of what's the structure of that debate like? Well, my teacher, uh, Yale's Akil Vidamar, always really celebrates this as an extraordinary, extraordinarily democratic moment for its time. And there are reasons for this. So, you know, if you're an ordinary American, so not just elites, but members of the middle class, and even people who are, you know, farmers on the frontier, you care about this new constitution. It's going to affect your life. And so we do see a really lively free debate in newspapers, in pamphlets, but also in bars and taverns, face to face, Americans debating the constitution. And once we get into the state ratifying conventions, heated debates, pros and cons and free debates. Really, again, you know, one of the great themes in American history is the importance of debate, deliberation, but also dissent. And so we see this in these debates, they're free. And so they set an important precedent from that perspective. You know, if we're looking at how the ratification process unfolds from there, well, you know, if we're looking at who are these delegates that are actually in the conventions, you know, most of them are rich, white, male property holders. So, I mean, from the perspective of our day, uh, we would see this as far too elite and far too exclusionary, but they're not the only ones that are at these conventions. We also have, you know, merchants, members of the middle class. We see, we have poor farmers from the frontier. And so we already see the effects culturally of the American revolution. There's still hierarchy, there's still elites and what, what they would look at as the, the, you know, the many or the lower class, but there is a greater leveling out of who the political leadership is in the United States. And that's important to know. States also, as they're deciding how to select these delegates, waive some of their typical voting requirements, including property requirements. So, you know, as you're looking at who's, who's voting for the delegates in these conventions, it's nearly all, you know, frankly, it's, it's, it's all male, white uh, taxpayers. So not just property holders, but taxpayers. You also do see free African-Americans voting in certain states. Within the delegates of these conventions too, you see different states waiving, well, actually allowing delegates into their conventions that they wouldn't even allow into the upper houses of their state legislatures. So you have those sorts of requirements. You, you, they're, they're, the, the conventions are designed to be very democratic for their own time. And you know, as we're looking at ratification unfold, we'll, 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 we'll go into some of the details of this story, but we do see a combination of some quick ratifications and some real, real hard fights. And so you see quick ratification in states like Delaware, Connecticut, South Carolina, Maryland. So there are some quick ratifications, but we do see really, really closely contested fights where, where the, the Federalists really think they can lose in important states like Massachusetts, like Virginia, like New York. And so it's, again, it's important to remember that these are extraordinarily close fights. Now, to, just to give a, a, a sense of this moment, I love this quote from one of my heroes, Pennsylvania's James Wilson, who was a key figure at the convention and a key Federalist during the ratification fight. And here he is, it's a July 4th celebration, 1788. And so the constitution actually at this point has already been formally ratified, but New York is not ratified it yet. So it's, it's Wilson talking about this moment. And he says, you have, you have heard of Sparta, of Athens, of Rome. You have heard of their admired constitutions, but did they 
ever furnish an exhibition similar to that which we now contemplate. Uh, were their constitutions framed by those who were appointed for that purpose by the people? And after they were framed, were they submitted to consideration of the people? And so it's this extraordinary moment of creation and a creation that's linked to both the framers at the Constitutional Convention and then the American people having to see, say yay or nay. The two big ideas here, Curry, and, and I, I know I've gone on for too long, but I do want to telegraph it before we get into the rest. Um, so one, this is a close fight. The Federalists have a million advantages. They have George Washington on their side. They have a million advantages, James Madison, et cetera. But it's an extraordinarily close fight the Federalists could have lost. The second is the importance of popular sovereignty. And this is, you know, we celebrate Constitution Day, September 17th, 1787, an extraordinary moment. The thing to remember is the Constitution at that point in time, it's only a proposal. The only way it's going to become the law of the United States, the new government of the United States, is if the American people say yes through their state ratifying conventions. And you see Wilson, you see Madison, as their, one of the great anti-federalist attacks here is that the new constitution's illegal. The delegates to the convention exceeded their congressional mandate and, and, and they did something they weren't supposed to do and Madison and Wilson and the federalists counter with popular sovereignty. The American people have the right to alter and abolish their government. It's their most natural right. It's what under, underlied the American revolution itself. And here, once again, we're gonna give them the chance to say yes or no. And that's the core of popular sovereignty. And I think that's like the, the biggest takeaway from this is that, first of all, unlike the articles, it's only nine out of the 13 states. Yes. They don't have to have everybody. If we remember, and if you were in last week's class with the Articles of Confederation, everybody had to agree 100%. It was not like that. So A, they learned that lesson, super smart. B, that they utilize the idea of giving it back to the people. And that is going back to your Akil reference. That's the first lecture I ever got from Akil was that they didn't, didn't act like a czar, didn't act like um, kings or monarchs, that they didn't sign it to say that it was law. They signed it to say we believe in it, except for these three guys, uh, <laughs> but they gave it back to the people. And that's popular sovereignty rippling through the world and saying, look, we're so invested in this experiment we're gonna start off with it. And I know Massachusetts had done that already with their state con um, constitution. And that was so, so effective that the delegates looked and said, you know, Massachusetts did it, we should do it for everybody. But I think that's the part to remember that it's not law on September 17th. It is an idea that the people get to choose. And again, defining we the people at this time, it gets a little broader but it's not completely open the way we see it today. So that's a big kind of wrap up in there and pulling it together. But what I wanna do is I wanna spend a little bit of time, Tom, we, we always say Federalist, Anti-Federalist. So everybody talks about the Federalist for like an hour and then the Anti-Federalist gets like five minutes. But we, when we have dissent in America, when we have discussions and discourse and we pull things apart more, that makes us better. So let's start with, I refer to lovingly as the Rockies of the um, ratification <laughs> process, the guys who lost but still made a huge difference, the Anti-Federalists. So can we jump into the Anti-Federalists? Can you name a few since they are so hard to find pictures of? I only have a few pictures of them, but <laughs> I mean, you can start with these guys who, who stayed at the convention and protested. And I know you went over them earlier, but uh, maybe you can tell us kind of what was the anti-federal big problem with this new constitution? What were they worried about? Sure, so I mean, so we, we have the dissenters here, um, you know, probably the most famous anti-federalist is Virginia's uh, uh, Patrick Henry, you know, he of, of uh, give me liberty or give me death uh, fame. Uh, so he's an important voice in Virginia that didn't go to the constitutional convention but was an important anti-federalist voice in the Virginia ratifying convention. And so, you know, what were the, what, so let's say, so what, what were the main objections here of the anti-federalists? What, what were their main arguments? Well, they're rooted in part on who they are. And so who were the anti-federalists? Th those were some of the big names, but if we're looking at them compared to the federalists, you know, they're, they're, they're more likely to be small farmers than members of the commercial elite, so lawyers or merchants, so it's small farmers. These are the, the farmers that we thought about from Shays Rebellion who have a ton of debt, can't pay their property taxes, are in risk of losing their farms, and are you know, sort of dissatisfied with so many features of their governments. Well, they would also be anti-federalists, concerned about a national government that's very far from them on the frontier. You know, Westerners were more likely to oppose the Constitution than Easterners. And again, this is proximity. 
it's, you know, it takes a long time to get from the commercial centers on the East Coast to some of these frontier towns. And so there's a real separation of, of culture, um, uh, 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 of information and of, of needs in one place versus the other. Northerners were more likely to support the constitution than Southerners and small states produce fewer anti-federalists uh, uh, versus uh, larger states. You know, if we're looking at the anti-federalists as a group, so those are some of their characteristics, but as a group, they really separate into three different categories. And, and here I'm, I'm pulling from the great historian of anti-federalists, Saul Cornell, who separated the anti-federalists into elite anti-federalists, middling anti-federalists, Federalists and uh, plebeian anti-federalists. And so when he goes from elite to what you would consider more ordinary people uh, on, 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 uh, you know, in, in society writ large. And so what are some of the differences here? I think the easiest way to summarize is you go from the elite to the plebeians is that as you get go from the elite to further down to more ordinary Americans, there's greater support for democracy. And so you see increasing uh, criticisms of anti-democratic features of the constitution, things like the Senate, especially things like the Supreme Court and the federal courts, things like the presidency. And you see calls for, you know, really wanting to make sure that government policy is set by bodies that are closer to the American people. And also a concern about aristocracy. And so they're really concerned about, you know, basically, if you think about it, a lot of them are on the frontier, they're frontier farmers. And so they're concerned about a national government meeting in a place like Philadelphia, you know, it, it, uh, a commercial center, something that's completely alien to all of them. And that small group of elites doing things that aren't going to be good for people on the frontier, they're not going to hear the voice of the people on the frontier. And that as a result of that, you're going to have a similar alienation from the central government. You know, for, if you're in Western Pennsylvania, is it that different if your national government's sitting in Philadelphia versus in London? I mean, you're not likely to go to either place. And so there is some concern there of that sort of, of that sort of disconnect. If we're thinking about what are some of the critiques that really unify you know, the elites all the way down to the plebeian anti-federalists, it ends up being really a, a fear of what they would call consolidation. And so it really the simplest way to think about this is they're afraid of a really, really strong and distant national government. And so the, the anti-federalists largely are interested in governments that are closer to the people. And so, you know, for the elites and for the middling, they really love state governments. For the plebeian anti-federalists, they actually love local governments. So even below the state down to the local level. But writ large, what they're afraid of is you have a national government that is going to have a bunch of power, is going to keep consolidating this power, consolidating this power, and effectively destroy the state and local governments. And why is this bad from their perspective? Well, it's bad from both the perspective of what we would say federalism, so power that goes to the states, but also from the perspective of popular sovereignty and democracy, what they really, really want is they want to make sure that the governments hear the voice of the people, that they truly are as democratic as possible, and that they aren't just the voice of you know, distant elites. And so the concern here is if you have a national government that destroys the state and local governments, you're destroying the governments that are closest to the people, and that is the path to tyranny. It's the path to standing armies. It's the path to a national government with unlimited power. It's the path to a strong federal judiciary that continues to empower the national government. It's the path, it's the path, it's the path. And that's that's the concern. Again, remember, they just, we, you know, not that long ago fought an American revolution against a distant British government, and they are fearful that they they didn't want to just have fought that 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 revolution to then be ruled by distant elites in Philadelphia. So that's the anti-federalists. And I, I think it's so important because they they don't get to play in this, but when you hear the anti-federalist stories and Again, I know everybody always gets told, oh, the Federalist Paper, the Federalist Paper, and we'll talk about the Federalist Papers in a little bit, but read the writings of the Anti-Federalists as well, because they're going to be the ones that sound more about we the people, popular sovereignty, kind of those tonal things that we line ourselves up with. There are the reasons why we have the Bill of Rights because of this pushback. And again, that really kind of energizes everything. So I, I think they should get more cred is what really my point is uh, around it. Um, and it makes total sense that a guy like Patrick Henry, which I could find a picture for, um, would be somebody that was worried about a big federal government taking over and squashing the individual local, um, local government and state government. Um, and so it makes total sense because he lived through the revolution. He lived through that time period. Now, um, Tom, can you guess who the picture is of the other person or the sketches? 
I have to say, I, I don't know, Curry. I, 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 look, I, was, I, 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 was, I was very curious as I was looking at it. Um, and I always feel like I butcher his first name, so uh, correct me if I get it wrong, but um, um, Smith, what is his first name? Melanchthon Smith? Yeah, that's, that's, that's going to be my guess. Yeah, that's Melanchthon Smith, which I was trying to find a few others, and I will do a bit, I will make sure I add that in as we go, but I was like, I need to represent somebody other than Patrick Henry, a name that we don't know as well, but we should know. So again, forgot, Forgotten Founders really played a huge role. Now let's dive into the Federalists. Um, the Federalists are so well known, and you know what? They, you said this earlier, but they start off this battle for the Constitution with a lot of extra points, um, meaning in like a huge way. Um, what are kind of what are the kind of the ground, the grounding pieces that they have when they begin this battle on September 17th? What's already on their side for for getting that Constitution adopted? Yeah, I mean, I think the greatest advantage they had, um, other than having, you know, key figures like George Washington on their side, that's kind of a big one. People can look at Washington and say, you know, there, there, there may be some real, and, you know, we obviously have that from Lin-Manuel as well, but, uh, but you know, what could be better than that if, if you have an imperfect constitution, but you know that George Washington is going to be the first president? That's a huge advantage. You know, if you're looking at a structural advantage in the debate itself, you know, one of the great advantages was that the Federalists could frame the debate as it's either this new constitution or a lousy Articles of Confederation. And so you really, you may not love the new constitution, but Americans broadly, even some of the anti-Federalists would say, we either need to do something with the Articles of Confederation or we need to scrap it for something else. Um, but the debates in their state ratifying conventions are just framed as new constitution or status quo under our really lousy Articles of Confederation which really helps. And it goes back to, you know, the, you know, one way to think about the debate between the anti-federalists and the federalists is that, you know, the, it's, 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 you know, that it takes a government plan to beat a government plan. And so the federalists <laughs> have the advantage of having a government plan. They can say, we've signed on to this. This is the alternative. We've even put an amendment process in Article 5 where you can revise it over time if you don't like what you see. Um, but we have a plan. Anti-federalists, where are your plan? You could throw stones at ours, but where is your plan? And so there's that structure of debate, you know, that's there. If you're looking at the federalists themselves, apart from just the famous names like, you know, George Washington, but they also had James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, John Dickinson, James Wilson, Gouverneur Morris, like really, really uh, both famous names with great minds on their side. Um, and so that's an obvious advantage. But more broadly, the federalists, they tend to be more educated um, part of the upper class, they reside in the cities, and broadly speaking, they're nationalists in their outlook. So they really wanted, you know, a stronger national government. Um, if you're trying to think of like, what is the balancing act they're trying to do with the new constitution? It's one, they really know we want a national government that's stronger than the Articles of Confederation, but we also want a limited national government. We don't want to go totally crazy about this. And so it's about striking a balance between a government that works versus guarding against the dangers of a national government that will suddenly have, you know, guard against the dangers of abuse of power and abuse of liberties. And so that's the balance that they're trying to strike there. Um, you know, if, if we're, and I, you know, if, if we're looking, um, you know, substantively as to, you know, what does this vision end up looking like? Um, well, you know, we often focus on the really famous, so, you know, we, we focus on the famous Federalists, so especially the most notable ones tend to be James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, we focus on the Federalist Papers. And, you know, the Federalist Papers are these series of essays written, you know, especially around the, the ratification debates in New York um, that end up, you know, being one of America's great statements of constitutional theory. I mean, they end up being a major contribution to how people think about governments over time. Um, you know, they, I'm just looking for the, the stats here. So you have Madison writing 29 of these essays, Hamilton writing 51, and John Jay writing only five. So John Jay's, he's writing some of the early ones before he gets sick. And John Jay ends up focusing on the importance of national unity to the future of the United States, its future security. Um, and so he has a, some really interesting early essays, but we tend to focus on Hamilton and Madison. Madison being more, if we're thinking about, so what are some of the features of, of the writings of Madison versus Hamilton? Madison's more the political theorist. He's thinking in high theory about things like representation and structure, whereas Hamilton really is you know, the, the, the Federalist lawyer. I mean, he's precise. He's taking on direct points made by the Anti-Federalists. And so there's sort of a, he's taking on precise things like the nature of the federal judiciary and congressional power and et cetera, et cetera. And so that's sort of the, you know, the at, at a macro level where Hamilton 
and, and Madison are, are contributing in the Fed Rules papers. What's the, what's the broader vision? We're, you know, what, what do we settle on here? You know, I think the most, you know, the most famous thing we tend to focus on is the structure of the Constitution. And we get this especially, you know, from Madison and Federalist 10 and Federalist 51. And this is an idea of, you know, we're, it's a new experiment. We're creating a very large republic. And people like, you know, great political theorists like Montesquieu would, and as many of the anti-federals will say, you can't do that. Republics, democracy, it really only works in small communities, communities where people are very similar. Um, and that it becomes really impossible, it becomes impossible to extend that over a, a large sphere like the United States. And the danger being that, you know, one, we won't have enough unity to have coherent policy, but two, we might have, having, might have national majorities run roughshod over local majorities. So local majorities that are, that are national minorities, but you might end up having a national government that attacks the right of local majorities to govern. And so what, what, what we do there, and, and you know, the thing we focus on with the Federalists especially are things like the structural things. So we have a, a large republic. The advantage of this per Madison is that it makes it more difficult for factions to form. And so you won't, you know, the threat, there, there'll be less of a threat of a majority combining to suppress a majority, a, a minority, precisely because the republic is so big. But we also set up structural principles, things like separation of power. So we divide national power between a president a legislature and a judiciary. And then we divide power again. We divide it between a national government and, a, and state government. So this is the idea of federalism. And through this structure, we can you know, both ensure a national government with new powers, things like the power to raise armies and, and to, to, to levy taxes and to regulate interstate commerce and to uh, you know, dictate foreign policy and to declare war. So they could do big things when we can come together and do that. But we're gonna also protect the rights of minorities because it's going to be relatively hard for majorities to form at the national level. And we're also going to pr preserve power for the states. So it, it, in this federalist vision, there's still great responsibilities. And we'll talk about this more next week, Curry, obviously, when we get to federalism, but still great responsibilities in the state governments to define policy, policies that are very close to the people of those various states and ensure, you know, really hearing the cry of the anti-federalists that we want many key policies to be defined at the state and local level. And so that's the Federalist response there. You know, if we're looking beyond structure, the last thing I'll note of, of, the, of the Federalist perspective is what they would call civic Republican virtue. And so the idea here being that we want to structure a national government that's going to allow policy to be driven by things like reason, deliberation, compromise. They would say coolness and moderation. And so they would say another virtue of having a large republic and a national government that large republic is that it extends the sphere of each electorate so that only really the best and the brightest of each state, each locality are gonna get elected to the national government. And so the vision here is that the national government's going to elect the best and the brightest. They're gonna help lead public debates over policy. The American people will be happy with that. And over time, there's going to be a love of country and a respect for government that's going to develop. Um, and so the, the fundamental thing from a, the perspective of popular sovereignty is that you're still going to have the American people drive the government through electing members of the House of Representatives, through indirectly electing senators and, and, and the president. So you're still going to have the American people driving who is going to be in government and holding them accountable at the polls. But you're also going to have a dynamic conversation between leaders and the governed. And that over time, what you hope to do is to slow down politics, use those structures to slow down politics, promote deliberation, promote public education where the elites are learning from ordinary Americans and ordinary Americans are learning from the elites. And then over time, this is going to create better policy. And so that's their theory. We, you know, we, we can have debates as to how well that worked even in their own time <laughs> versus later. But, but you know, I, I, I just wanted to pause on that, Curry, because I feel like we end up focusing so much and so often on the, the, the interesting structure of the Constitution that we lose sight sometimes of what they expected sort of the culture of politics to be uh, for the national project to work. And so I wanted to get that in there as well. And I'm gonna go back in a minute to the Federalist Papers because I wanna make sure I have these numbers right because I know Hamilton wrote, wrote the bulk of them. So I just wanted to make sure, because I know 29 wasn't right. Um, did I flip James Madison and Hamilton? Was Madison oh, So, so uh, Hamilton I have down is 51 and Madison is 29 and Jay is five. That's what I did. Yeah, that's what I did. Because yeah, I knew Hamilton is a, um, a crazy writer and you're right he was very like it, like incision like in responding like I am just like a lawyer I'm going to go right to this point and I'm going to counter it um, but I think that I, I don't want to lose sight of what you said there like this idea that 
the that they were setting up this system so that there would be layers and kind of looping mechanisms in it for discussion and compromise and conversation, you know, also at times was used by the anti-federalists to say, but if it doesn't work, it turns into an elite system. So you can hear that kind of push and pull between the two, but you're also watching this play out across country. And so I know two of my favorite things, and I know it sounds weird because they're like negative, but they're really interesting, is number one, uh, George Mason wrote a letter at this time to Washington. And Mason's letter, I always like to refer to it as like a how, how dare you letter, but Mason and Washington are friends. And as this debate is going on, some of the anti-federalists are being called anti-patriotic. Um, and say, what, you know, what are you doing? You're not helping our country. Because remember, the Federalists are saying, like, not just we'll go back to the Article of Confederation, but we'll go back to disaster, because they're referencing Shays' Rebellion. And I know Yates spoke of that all the time. He's like, Yates said that the Federalists were so good at marketing the Constitution and with like fear tactics of what it could be go back to. It could go back to insurrection and fighting amongst the American people. And so how do they use it? So now you've got people saying, well, if you're against the constitution, you're anti-patriotic. And Mason writes a letter to Washington and says, you know, I do this for love of country. You know, I do this because I am a patriot. So that's why we lovingly refer, refer to these three guys as the dissenters, saying like when their voice dissents, we then go through that process and that system and bring things back together. But Tom, my other favorite person that never gets talked about is somebody else who wrote in the Federalist Papers about this. And I know it was George Washington's favorite Federalist paper and he shared it the most because he thought it was the most accessible, but also it was talking about listening to different perspectives. Can you talk about Dickinson for a minute? <laughs> Yeah, so, so John Dickinson, another key figure at the convention, you know, another, you know, key Federalist voice, you know, during these debates. And Dickinson really, I think, takes Mason's, you know, if, if we were reading Mason's letter, would take his point on board and to say precisely what, what, what Mason was saying, which is that, you know, it, 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 it may be annoying that these anti-Federalists are out there attacking our handiwork. They weren't, many of them weren't in the room. They don't know how hard it was to forge this compromise, but they are doing it precisely for patriotic reasons. And then, you know, in the end, I, I, would, I would think that for someone of, you know, Dickinson's perspective, the idea is that this debate is going to end up making the constitution better and stronger and promote, again, sort of this spirit of dialogue, debate, respectful dissent. And really, you know, I, I, and I don't wanna fast forward too much, Carol, though we're getting to the end of our time together, but you know, it, it, it's important to think about that perspective from, you know, what happens once ratification actually happens? What's going to become of the anti-federalists, those who oppose the Constitution? Are they going to see the process as legitimate, the Constitution as good enough and something that they can revise and an American project that they can sign on to? Or are they going to try to work extra constitutionally, extra legally to try to oppose what this new government's doing? And the Bill of Rights becomes absolutely crucial to making sure the anti-federalists, people like Patrick Henry, get on board and say, we don't love this Constitution, but we're able to amend this constitution and the proof is in what we just did. We, 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 we argued in this, the state ratifying, so the dissenters argued at the convention, we need a bill of rights. We argued in the state ratifying conventions, especially in Massachusetts, Virginia, and New York, those last big states that are so critical that had big anti-federalist contingents that we need a bill of rights. And here we are in the first Congress, um, the constitution's ratified. James Madison, who initially was skeptical of the bill of rights, really taking his, his, his taking, taking, the char taking charge of ensuring that a Bill of Rights finds its way through the first Congress. And remember this first Congress, the first set of national elections give us George Washington, the Federalist in many ways as president, strong Federalist majorities in the House and Senate. So it would have been easy for the Federalists to just say, ah, oh, we have power, we don't have to listen to those anti-Federalists. But they didn't do that. And it's, it's Madison shepherding through a Bill of Rights um, that responds to some of the concerns of the anti-federalists. And then it's the anti-federalists on the flip side saying, you know, this looks, for now, this looks okay to us. We're going, but we're, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna forge debates over time. We're gonna be part of this political process. We're gonna argue for a vision of the constitution that's more limited than what you want. And we're gonna do that in politics and et cetera, et cetera. And we're gonna do that through amendments. And it, it begins the American project. The debates that we still have over 
How big is the, how big is you know what's the proper scope of the national government versus the scope of the states? What sort of rights are, do we have? You know, protect. What sort of rights protections do we have? What's the role of courts in protecting minority rights? How much should we have majority rule versus the protection of minority rights writ large? These are the debates they're having at the ratifying conventions, and these are the debates they're having in the first Congress and onward. And the Bill of Rights is this a key inflection point where you have the great Federalist John, James Madison hearing the criticisms of the anti-federalists, hearing the criticisms of his friend Thomas Jefferson and saying, we're going to keep our promise from these state ratifying conventions and make sure that a Bill of Rights ends up in the Constitution. And so the American project begins. And it makes me feel better that we're ha still having the same debates they had. <laughs> so there's almost something comforting in the fact that it, this is a process that we have to go through. So the big ideas that we wrap up with is the Constitution on September 17th was not the law of the land. It had to go through a long process to be ratified, and that was not a done deal. But that discussion, debate, and excitement over that brought in many people, not just a few, and wound up with a ratified constitution that quickly um, added the Bill of Rights. Thanks to Madison, we'll give him some major cred there. And I think the other point that's really, really important is even though the people in power didn't want that directly, they still knew that this is a tool that the minority wanted and that it was better for our country. So they worked forward with it. So I think that's really, really important. And that again, that other thing that you said, Tom, that I love more than anything else is that this is a grand experiment in debate deliberation and dissent. And that's just who we are and always have been for 233 years and a little bit more. <laughs> No, that's that, that, that's absolutely right. And yeah, no, the, the, and the, the last thing to, to I think all of that is a great rap curry. And the last thing to just always keep in mind, because it's so counterintuitive, is it was a real fight. The Federalists could have lost. They wound up hearing the criticisms on the other side. They wound up promising that they would put a Bill of Rights into the Constitution. And then eventually it took actually like roughly two years to ratify the Bill of Rights, the, the first yeah, kind of that's the Constitution. So it was time. yeah, so it so it still did take time. Uh, but that, you know, the process ends up with that integrated whole that we see today, you know, between the original Constitution of 1787 and those first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights. Um, and we're going to have plenty of time to talk about all of that in the weeks ahead. I know. We have a session on the Bill of Rights. We have a session on the president. So we are so excited. We want to thank you all for joining us for class. We are wrapping up now. If you have questions, we can stay for a minute and answer them because Craig did actually ask a really good question in the Q&A. So if you can hang out for a minute. Please do. I'm going to stop the recording. Stop the screen share. <laughs>